All right, well, I'm going to start this thing recording. And what, like I said, what I'll do is when we're done, Phil, and it's downloaded, then I'll trim it, make sure everything looks good, and then we'll be good to go. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Trenton Clark with the Virginia Asphalt Association. And I'd like to welcome you the, to the, the More You Know webcast series. In this series, we're going to cover a whole list of topics, and today's topic is moving to performance balance mix design. So today, as we go through this webinar and this webcast, we're going to do some quick housekeeping. We'll get into the heart of the presentation with Phil Blankenship. Then we're going to take some questions from the attendees at the end and then have some closing comments. So we're glad to see so many of you with us today. <clears throat> if you've never used Zoom because you've been living under a rock since COVID, pretty simple. We're in the webinar mode. So if you have a question, all you need to do is click on that Q&A and just type your question in. And as we go through the webinar, as your questions come in, some of them will answer. Other questions will save to the very end so everybody can hear the question as well as hear the response that Phil has. This webcast can only be possible from a whole list of our uh, partners. For our 2023 partners, we have those that are at the platinum level all the way down to the gold. We've got some upcoming events, so you'll be seeing more emails coming out in the coming weeks. So make sure you mark those down. The big one is our training classes that will be starting in January. So we hope if you've never done mixed design, you need to sign up and become part of that mixed design class. So with that, what I'd like to do is welcome Phil Blankenship with Blankenship Asphalt Technologies. Phil and I go way back. When you get to a uh, VR age, uh, you start talking about decades. And Phil's one of the renowned uh, mixed designers, not only here in the U.S., but he's known around the world. And we've been talking with Phil for many months. He's helped us with some of our training manuals. So if you've been in VCAT, you've seen some of the stuff we've done with balanced mix design. But Phil's very involved, not only on the research side, but what's even more importantly, he's involved in the practical side, the operations from a job mix formula to actually doing the work in the field. And as we're moving forward with this balanced mix design, as we, if you think far enough back, if you're old enough, you remember the Marshall days, and then we jumped into the super paved days and realized right off the bat, we were making mixes that didn't rut, but we also made mixes that weren't durable, had too high gyrations, drying them out today. Virginia's a 50 gyration state. We've done a lot of things to make sure we're improving the crack resistance. We've never had really a rutting issue, but now as we're going into the balanced mix design, we're really looking at what do we need to do to optimize performance. And with that, that's why we've asked Phil to join us today and to talk about what can be done to move us toward performance mix design. So with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Phil. He's got a great presentation that he's gonna walk us through. Again, if you have any questions, just uh, type them in. And at the end of the presentation, the end of the webcast, we'll go through your questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Phil. Thank you very much. I'm gonna get this uh, ready to go on my end. And, um then away we go. <clears throat> so again, I want to uh, I want to thank um, the association um, and uh, Trenton Mike for allowing me to be able to to do this today. And glad to get to join you all the way from Kentucky. I've been there to the Mid Atlantic uh, show, and uh, what a what a good time that is, and uh, what a always a good turnout. With that, um, I'm happy to be a member of, of VAA and, and again, get to, to share this with you today. What I, well, I always like to start off with is sort of, you know, where we're at and how we got to where we're at today. Some of the challenges that we have before us um, were laid out by ASCE when they, when they went to DC 
to try to get the, the current infrastructure bill. And what they pointed out was that no different than, than from 20, uh, the years earlier in 2017, 2019, is that um, our report card for our roadways, now they, they look at everything from, from pipes to internet and, and, and water quality, but just on our roads, we had a D. The good news is it didn't go down to an F, uh, but it sure didn't get better. Why is that? Well, uh, you have a large road structure to maintain, 4 million miles of public roadways, uh, and you see there some of the stats that, and, and the, the amount of vehicle miles traveled. The one that really stands out to me is the bottom bullet point, and down here that every lane mile of roadway costs approximately 24000 annually um, in operation and maintenance. So if you go and replace that, um, you know, again, assuming today's dollars, you go and replace that in 10 years, uh, just that one lane mile of roadway is, is, a, is a quarter million dollars that you could be looking at and in, 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 in working on it. Um, as we do that, there becomes a responsibility, not only from the agencies, but also us as, as innovators, as designers, as contractors, uh, to be able to, to, to do all of this. So we have this really complex problem that we have in a low bid world. And, and the key to that is proper specifications and specifications and also the, the care and initiative to, to put down what we see as quality pavements. With our current rating of a D, that means that 43% of the system is, is in poor mediocre condition. Um, we still have people that a lot of fatalities and we can't control all of those. In Kentucky, we are making a, a, a push at that because we have this sedimentary material with what we call limestone that tends to polish. So friction becomes a, an issue where I'm at in, in some of the other states. With that, you also have other factors that play in across the U.S. and some states that can't afford to continue paving and they're depaving roads. So a, a lot of challenges that are laid out before. So what's the recommendation? And it's not necessarily to build new roads, it's to fix the roads that we have. Focus on resources, focus resources on preserving a state of good repair. So raising that number that I just mentioned at 43% of the system in poor condition, let's, let's raise um, that number to 43% in good condition if we could do so. Um, and, 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 and hopefully we can get it on up to 100% in good condition if, if, if that were the case. Uh, we need increased funding from all levels of government and then of course develop state and local plans. And, and, and as we begin to develop that, that's a big part of what we have here is we're sort of following in that bullet point, uh, the, latter, the lower bullet point is how do we uh, begin to have a better plan or a better specification to improve and raise the grade that's been put before us. All of this is happening um, at, that we're trying to fix our mixes that we have here today at a time that we also have a massive sustainability push, the, the 2050 race to net zero carbon uh, which we have, uh, we we hear a lot is called as environmental product declarations or EPDs that are that are coming. I know just next year I heard that there are about five test projects that will be released, uh, in which they'll be evaluating those across the U.S. and trying to understand what these new uh, specifications and and regulations will look like. So uh, before I jump into sort of my opinion of it, I want to go over just a, a balanced mixed design review and what it is. Uh, it was put well by, by a good friend of mine, Shane Buchanan. And Shane said, you know, a balanced mixed design is an asphalt mixed design using performance test, balanced mixed design test, if you want to call it that, on appropriately conditioned samples or specimens that addresses multiple modes of distress taking into account mix aging, traffic, climate, and location within the pavement structure. Well, let's, let's break that down for a moment. So again, it's an asphalt mix design, but notice we're not talking about volumetrics. We're gonna, it, the performance piece of this is using the APA in Virginia, using Catabro, using Ideal CT on appropriately conditioned samples. Well, that could be four hour aging, two hour aging, but we may also do something for long-term aging to understand um, the, the effects of the oil. In a, in, a, in a longer term environment to address multiple modes of distresses, rutting, cracking, uh, just general durability. And in consideration of mix aging, <clears throat> uh, talking about that we've already talked about the conditioning, but also talking about climate because we have to do it at the right temperature. Um, what's good, for instance, where a lot of the, the, the ideal CT came out of Texas, 
Um, but that may not be the exact temperature that you always need in Virginia. It's sure not the same temperature that you would be using uh, where they're evaluating this test in the northern U.S. and in, uh, and in Canada. They're using a, a cooler temperature, so the test will work uh, properly for them. And of course, location within the pavement. We know as we go lower in the pavement, uh, you have less shear stresses, but you also have a cooler pavement to work with. So BMD becomes this balance between durability and stability. And I have a, a, a slide on that to, to show that in a moment. Cracking being the most prevalent issue on our pavements today. Uh, dry mixtures result in durability issues. Again, I have a picture to show you where I, I uh, was able to grab a picture from a a highway that I think depicts that really well. And there's a need to understand the performance uh, through this performance related testing or index testing or proof testing, whatever that we want to call it today. There was a, a survey done a few years ago uh, by, by NCAT. I think it was done by NCAT. And, and in developing the framework for balanced mix design, uh, Randy West uh, and, and authors reported that reflection cracking, thermal cracking, fatigue cracking, longitudinal cracking, raveling, all were top distresses. Notice the, the word there that, that, is, that is, uh, keeps to repeat is cracking, 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 cracking. Uh, then you followed by raveling, slippage, moisture damage, and rutting. I remember, um, Trenton, you had mentioned it, I remember the, the pavements in eastern Kentucky uh, that were the famous slides that were put together for super pave. I had the opportunity uh, in 1992 to be part of the team that developed uh, the super paved gyratory compactor uh, gyration table. And, and a big part of that was using the improved aggregate specifications. And when we, when we developed the gyration table, we knew it was important to understand, to simulate a, a better method of compaction, one that's gonna be more consistent. But the famous slide that kept being thrown up is that we do not want this rutting uh, that was that was nearly about four to six inches deep. Uh, that would we called it hands-free driving uh, on the coal roads in eastern Kentucky, where you could take your hands off the wheel and your and your car stays in a track and it sort of drags as it goes through. We don't see that today for the most part um, on any of the roads that 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 I drive anyway. You may see that in maybe localized yards where you don't have um, uh, current um, uh, uh, agency specifications, more private specs. But rutting is not an issue today. However, now we swung the pendulum the other way where cracking is an issue. Here's that picture of the pavement that I mentioned. Um, I was driving and the traffic slowed down. And what's a good engineer to do that works in pavements other than when the traffic almost and sort of becomes to a stop, um, you open your door and you take a good picture. And that's what I did here. This pavement shows a lot that's going on. You see block cracking happening, which will begin sort of as a longitudinal crack but then they'll begin to connect. Uh, you see the longitudinal joint falling apart, which is usually about uh, 18 inches on each side of the joint where you're compacting an, an unconfined edge um, it, and it deteriorates more. You, you see raveling happening. So here, the characteristics that you would have of a, of a, of a non-durable mix is gonna be dry, usually low in asphalt content. It's gonna block crack, longitudinal joints will deteriorate, allows for water intrusion, and it could ravel. And this one definitely is raveling. Limitations that we have a volumetric mix design is we rely heavily on air voids um, and voids in the mineral aggregate uh, to establish the minimum uh, percent effective binder. Uh, VMA is only aggregate as, as accurate as aggregate bulk gravities. Binder quality um, and, and effective additives that can be good, could be, could be bad. It just depends on the combination of materials. Uh, somebody asked me one time, Phil, what do you really do? And I said, well, I'm a civil engineer by trade, but I've really focused on the material science of what we have here today. And, and this gets to be a, a complicated issue that a lot of the, the laymen uh, do not understand, even folks in our industry that may not have a, a deep respect of what we get into because of the combinations of materials that vary on a, could vary on a daily basis that, that we, as, as the uh, technologist, have to go and make work that builds our infrastructure that we have. We have recycled products, of course, uh, that, 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 that was not addressed <clears throat> necessarily in the volumetric mix design, and then other additives, fibers, polymers, warm mix additives, and so on. One story I want to share is I remember 1993, 94 maybe, had the opportunity, and Trenton, that begins to share our, our age 
and how far we go back and why the gray beard comes in. I remember um, getting to use the super paved gyratory on the first quality uh, assurance um, in the nation. And it was on I-75, I-64 here in Kentucky. I was working for the cabinet and the Marshall Hammer results came in. And my friend said, well, why don't you go ahead, Phil? And my boss actually he said, you go ahead and look at the gyratory since you're so eager to do it. And I did it and I spit out my, that time it printed on a paper and I printed it all out and I did the hand calculations. I said, look, the, the air voids have dropped on this mixture. It's, it's about 2%. A uh, contractor needs to take it up. Boy, I was eager to, to, to just jump right in. And, and that's the only word I learned is, 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 is contractors got to take it up. And, and he looked and he said, well, calm down, uh, Junior. <laughs> let's, let's wait and see what happens. Well, hours later, we get the Marshall results. The Marshall results uh, pop in and sure enough, confirm the same thing. <clears throat> the, the plan had gone out of control. <clears throat> and I said, well, are we going to make the contractor take it up or not? Well, what ended up happening is is they we we didn't and and didn't even penalize the contractor because my uh, my boss had a lot of wisdom and he said Phil this has polymer modified asphalt back then we called it PMAC one D and he said it's some of the best asphalt that we have I promise you it will not rut we will put a watch on it put the contractor on notice but let's see what it does sure enough fifteen to seventeen years later that pavement was rehabbed. It was one of the longer pavements sections that lasted in the state um, on, a, on a high traffic facility hitting nearly 40 million easels on, a, on 20 year design easels. Just going to show that volumetrics was not everything. If we had had it back then, we would have looked at it in a Hamburg device and it would have, or an APA, and it would have told us uh, it was good. We weren't using those tools back then. Another factor that comes into the importance, so just like I mentioned earlier that, that we talked about what happens on, on, on limitations of the volumetrics, we also now have a piece that comes in on the importance of binders. After I worked at the state, I went to work for Coke Materials Company, which is a part of Coke Industries in Wichita, Kansas, which was an oil refiner and, and still is today. They're known as Flint Hills up in the, um, up in the, up in the north and Minnesota area. I began, my eyes began to open on the differences in binder quality and, and again, how it changes. The folks who supply binder and, and hats off to them and, and all the binder supplies out there, they're very limited on adjustments that they can make. Um, you can go and you can begin to formulate and make uh, certain grades, but if you're looking at what's coming out of the refinery, it's pretty limited. And then your asphalt refiners then have to go uh, and or the asphalt suppliers take what's coming out of the refinery and make these adjustments to it. Um, we've had PPA and REOB, re re recycled engine oil bottoms or vacuum tower extenders used to meet some uh, PG specs. Are they bad? No, absolutely not. When used in moderation, when used blindly and not tested with certain combinations of materials, you could have an issue. 2020, the big talk was the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, that cut, that cut the sulfur going in uh, to the, um, to the, to the, to the uh, uh, ocean-going vessels, which means it threw that right back into our asphalt. Binder quality and content plays an important role in the performance. We know that, that rutting and permanent deformation can come in from high binder content. Uh, but we also know we can fix that with, with modifying the binder and, and making it where it will rebound and, and not rut, uh, somewhat like rubber. Uh, cracking, uh, raveling, durability happens from low binder content. But I can also get that if I have a binder that wants to age or a waxy binder that cools over a long period of time and begins to pack and, and, and physically harden. Again, not all 6422s perform the same in an ideal CT and Hamburg and an APA. So buyer beware, uh, check different sources. And it's not that one's necessarily good or bad, but can work differently in combinations with your aggregates and materials that you have available. Superpave, um, as soon as I came onto the scene um, and Superpave came out, uh, soon after about year 2000, RAP began uh, coming into the Superpave system. Superpave was never designed to handle RAP. So that was an add-on. Polymer modification even came on before that. Lowering gyration levels or design air voids became a, topular, uh, a very popular topic 
Um, now, how do we do this to adjust to get asphalt back in our mixtures? But it wasn't just about getting asphalt. It's how do we open up the gradation to, to get the asphalt in there? Addition of warm mix additives became quite popular uh, in the late 2000s. And as we see today, uh, has made a great impact on what we do today. And of course, in today's uh, lingo, uh, really since 2015, 2017, balanced mix design has become a more popular topic, also can be referred to as performance engineered mixes. Remember, lowering the gyration levels in air void, um, while it can achieve um, uh, similar performance, uh, you, 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 you have very different combinations to do it. Lowering the gyration level is lowering the energy level going into making it. Lowering the air void level, while it seems similar, it is, it is a little different, but it allows more asphalt in the mixture that way. Not just allowing more asphalt, but allowing more dust into the mixture. And, and so we have to watch that combination. Um, some places can get away with um, uh, that very easily. It works really well for them. Uh, if I've talked to my good friends down in NCAT, they have such clean aggregate. Uh, they're working off a dust proportion or dust asphalt ratio of a 1-0 most of the time. In, in the state of Kentucky, where I have sedimentary materials and you haul the limestone, they break down. A 1-3 may be the best that I can get. So every person, every contractor has these different combination of materials that we have to understand how these gyration levels and air voids will affect our mixture. Keeping in mind that making a change is not always, uh, you can't always increase optimum AC without correction of the aggregate gradation. I made that statement because uh, we may have to change the aggregate blend if we have a mixture that has too much dust in it. Uh, lowering air voids will increase optimum AC, um, usually with, with, a, with a constant uh, uh, VMA. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about how all that works in a moment. One thing that, that, that I want you to realize, though, at the end of the day, balanced mix design is, is beyond just analyzing the mix design volumetrics. It's beyond just adding asphalt, but it estimates a mixture's performance to cracking resistance, durability, and, and rutting resistance, which is stability. I also want to take this moment just to mention that if you go back and understand how that... Um, um, we have these wonderful tools. You maybe have, maybe you've asked, maybe you haven't. How did we come to the VMA character, the, the items that we have today, and the limits? Well, those are national specifications, and they were put forth as a first step. Uh, but they are not the end all because every mix has its own unique VMA, VFA. And surprise to you is that every mix also has a different maximum gradation curve. While we have a maximum gradation line that stretches that tells us if we're on top of that maximum density line, or not maximum gradation, but maximum density line, if we're on top of it, usually we have a perfect packing of materials. That is generally true, but since every aggregate has a different shape, just like you have every snowflake looks a little different, materials will pack differently. And so we cannot solely rely on these, on these tools that have been good to get us there. But now to, that we're to the stage that we're at with balanced mix design, it's time to let go of, of those tools. Use them to bring us as, as a as sort of a, te a teacher or a tutor to get us to where we're at today. But going forward, we wanna, we wanna leave those old tools and respect them where they were, but move forward with the new tools that we have today. In cracking, um, there's lots of tests out there, and if I'm up in the north, I may see a DCT. If I'm over in Illinois, I'll see an SCB uh, or in Louisiana. But for the most of the U.S., we're using a lot of ideal CT. Even California, that uses a lot of beam fatigue and still will, they also use um, the, the ideal CT for the simplistic piece. One neat thing about ideal CT is it's opened a lot of contractors' eyes um, open a lot of eyes to changes in binder quality, changes in air void. What happens if I silo a mix too long? We're now taking the tools and moving them from the academic side and putting them in the hands of the folks who are actually making the mixture. And then you have that aha moment to realize this small change can cause this effect or cause an effect uh, of what can happen to my mixture. On the, on the rutting side, we have everything from a flow number test that's more of the research level, which is a very good predictor of rutting, but right next to it that gives us a really good um, a feeling of what the mixer is going to do is the Hamburg wheel tracker that helps us understand stripping and rutting, and the APA, 
which is which is used, of course, in Georgia, used in Virginia, and a, and a and a and a great go-to test where we're using the um, concave wheel over a rubber hose, uh, indenting a sample. Of course, um, I, I should not fail to mention the FAA uh, is, is big on this test, and that is their primary lead test for rutting. Of course, they up the pressure in the hoses. Another add-on test, and I like to run this uh, in my laboratory. A lot of times we, we get asked, you know, uh, what's the durability of a mixture? Well, it, it's not just for general durability of, of, a, of, a, of a dense mix, but also good for OGFCs. It's good for SMAs. And, and you think about it, we, have, we do a lot of binder testing. We talk about DSR, BVR. We talk about aging it in a PAV and an RTFO. And, and boy, you can throw out every acronym you want. But one test we don't do is how sticky is that binder? How sticky is the product if I begin to look at it that I put my hand in and I begin to look at this binder? Um, and, and, I'm, and if you can see it there on the camera, I was holding a, a, just a, a, a sample of a binder up. Um, what I'm trying to understand is, is how sticky or how adhesive is that binder? The Catabro test is a really good way to understand those adhesion properties to help us understand if our binder is binding the mixture. And so uh, that's a, a, just a good durability adhesion test. Again, the plan, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that you talk about stability and durability. Um, on the bottom, it's a, it, it, it talks about asphalt content on the, on the graph on the left. And this came, came from NCHRP 2007 work. Um, the, 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 the axis on the left talks about durability or, or stability with high stability up top, low on the bottom, asphalt content on the bottom. Now, again, it's not just about asphalt content, but this is just a simple breakdown to help you understand. If I have a mixture that's really low in asphalt content, it's going to be highly stable. Now, if I take too much asphalt, then I have unbound granular material that, that falls apart. So there's a, there's a point in there of diminishing return. But as I add asphalt, my mixture becomes more durable and more stable to a point when I add too much. Now it's really durable and may not crack, but again, it will rut quickly and become very unstable. It will even push out of under the roller during the construction phase. What's been put forth, and I expect everybody to have memorized this for the test at the end, uh, not, uh, but this is just a good way um, that's been put together by our friends at NCAT to try to say there's sort of three schools of thought. One is a volumetric design, this focus on the top, volumetric design. And then as I get to the bottom, I'm gonna do my performance test on it. And then I'll do my moisture damage test. If it doesn't work, I'll go back up, but I'm doing primarily a volumetric design. Over here, I do a performance um, modified volumetric design uh, to where I, I, I begin to, sort of a hybrid or both. And then over to the right, I throw out the volumetrics altogether and I just look at the performance. <clears throat> Maybe one day we will end up in this, in this last part over here, but I still wanna say that, that I just got off of a job uh, this past summer where we did, uh, my company did the quality assurance on an airport project where we, where we uh, used performance-based specifications or BMD uh, type of testing for pay factors. Um, novel, uh, it was good. I'm glad we jumped into it, but we, we went from making um, two samples, three samples every 500 tons to 13 to 15. It's just not realistic to think that we can do that on a daily basis on every job. But what we can do is we can begin to do a performance level design check the volumetrics on it. So sort of coming back into the green area, check the volumetrics on it, then begin to use the green or, or, the, or the, uh, the volumetrics to guide us during the construction with a performance or a BMD check during the process. That's gonna be where we end up. That's the most practical. It's gonna take us a bit to get there because there's so many uh, pieces to implementation that we're working on right now. You know, if I go and design something in the laboratory, I, I, uh, I encourage folks to, to experiment. And I just want to show you this, what I did here. But um, depending upon what limits you have and what gradation limits you have, um, if you haven't had a chance to redesign your mixes, 
it's always good to don't always go do the same old, same old. You may find out that you're able to save on aggregate cost. You're able to save on asphalt cost. But as you, as you look at a redesign of your mixtures, uh, go in there and make something that's ultra fine. Make something that's, that's coarse or very gap graded that you'll see. And then make something that's in between. And then you begin to experiment. And, and this is just a real simple way to sort of look at, at, at three different points along the way. As you do that, I put the same asphalt content, for instance, in all of these. And, and as I took these and I, and I built that gradation and I, and I, and I come over here and I, I go and say, now let me look at my, my air voids. My air voids are gonna come out sort of all over the board. Um, but very quickly I see, wow, this one, this one came down pretty quickly. This may be most interesting. But depending on my VMA level, I may never want to look at this mixture. Um, however, with a performance engineered mixture or with a BMD approach on this mixture, using those tests, if it meets my BMD parameters, why do I care what the VMA is? Again, VMA has been a very good indicator to get us where we're at today. But now that I have the real test out there, I don't need to guess anymore. I can begin to use my rutting and my cracking and my durability or my Catabro test to help understand the end result performance. As we, as we look overall at, at what the, at what um, the goals are with BMD um, I show this graph that, that puts it all together and there's different ways I've seen uh, it plotted backwards <clears throat> on the bottom uh, that stands for rut resistance index. It's a different way to use a Hamburg uh, number, but let me break it down for you. Going from left to right, it's more rutting resistant. Going from bottom to top on my, my vertical axis, it's more cracking resistant. So in my red area, I have poor rutting and poor cracking. My green area is poor rutting, but really good cracking resistance. This is where we were in the 80s and, and early 90s. Where we're at today is in the purple area, poor cracking resistance, but good rutting resistance, really good rutting resistance. What we want to be careful and not do is swing the pendulum, as so many people say, and we swing this pendulum right back to the green area. We don't want to do that. We want to move our mixtures. And by the way, we have a measure for it, and it's this type of plot. We now can move our mixtures. Instead of from this area back in the diagonal, we can now move our mixtures north of where we're at today. We want to get them into this box. Now, these are limits I put in, um, you know, for, for Virginia, the CT, the CT index may be, uh, you're looking at a 70. Um, and instead of having a Hamburg, you're going to have a, you're going to have an APA value on it, but you can draw your own box and, and understand where that is. But I encourage every contractor to make a box like this, to understand exactly where you're moving on your mixes. You want to move into the box. And, and to do this, that's what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about uh, ways that we can do that today. In this example, and I'll just go ahead and mention it here, I had a 6422 um, of one source, but I also had a 6422 of a different source. So my gray and my blue are 6422s, both passing, nearly identical on passing, but perform differently in rutting and in cracking. Again, looking at the chemical compatibility of these mixtures. Then what I did is I looked um, at, at, I looked at, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry on that. Uh, this is the, uh, let me strike that. On this one, I did not uh, use two different um, asphalt binder sources. This one, I actually went from uh, one, um, the 6422 without fiber to using fiber. <clears throat> I do have an example of the other I'll mention here in just a bit. As I go and I look at this one, and I put fiber in it, it moves me in the direction that I want to be. Now, when I'm talking aramid fiber, we'll go into more detail in a minute, but it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's not cellulose fiber. It is not the old fiber uh, that would be used that we would consider uh, the old cellulose product uh, that's used as a sponge. This is a reinforcing fiber um, that, that's actually used and heat resistant um, it's the, of the Kevlar type, if you want to think of it that way. Then I took a 7022, which has a light polymer in it and put the fiber in it because of the better adhesion. It took that one way far north, um, one that would be incredible to go put down on any roadway. 
So there's different things. And what I want to do is spend some time now on talking about how to get your mixes into the box. So some general best practices for BMD. Um, make sure that you have an open mixture to allow room for the asphalt. <clears throat> While I mentioned that more VMA is usually a good indicator, don't let that be your sole indicator. If you've got intuition that tells you, I got a gut feeling on this one, guys, and I know I can go and make this one happen, um, give it a shot and, and see what's going to happen. Um, you hear, you hear um, um, Bill Pine talk a lot about with, with uh, the Bailey method, about opening the mixture up. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, opening it up can improve rutting, but also improve cracking because it allows more asphalt in the mixture. And, it, and one of the things I do want to mention, though, that somewhat is, is a truism, is the VFA curve. Uh, regardless of where your minimum VFA is, that don't pay, or, or, or I say minimum left of the VFA, I meant to say minimum to the left side of the VMA curve. So let me correct myself on that. Stay to the minimum left of the VMA curve. Regardless if it's a 13 VMA, a 14, or a 15 VMA, when you see that you begin to fill your voids um, and you see you cross over to the right side and you begin to push your aggregate apart with asphalt, realize that that's going to cause more rutting. Don't be afraid to do it a little bit because if you have room on the rutting and can gain some more cracking resistance, go for it. But just realize the more asphalt I put in it, it will eventually become a diminishing return and cause it to begin to want to rut. Realize that time in the silo or oven uh, can worsen cracking or worsen the CT, but it will improve a Hamburg result. Heat ages the binder, it increases absorption, and the heat also releases that. So you have this trifecta going on that will make the mixture more brittle by heating the binder, increasing absorption, and, and releasing the wrap binder. Use laboratory best practices, batching. And I can't say enough about being consistent, being consistent, being consistent in the laboratory. Grade your wrap um, by, uh, by heating and make the ideal CT samples with it. By, by, by what I mean by grading your wrap is not only physically grading your wrap, uh, which is a good thing to do and make sure that you don't uh, treat your wrap like any other aggregate. Don't, don't just throw it in one big pile, break it down into a coarse, medium and fine. What I'm talking about here though, is understand if I have different wrap piles, this wrap pile has a good CT index. This one has a medium, this one has a low one. How do you do that? Um, simply go in and add some asphalt to it, be consistent in what you're doing, or just compact a sample um, just compact a sample of your wrap and, and run a CT test on it. Uh, you probably see it, maybe it's about a 10 or something. Understand the CT value of just your wrap. Realize that aggregate can make a big difference um, in a Hamburg and ideal CT test. Granted, it's usually the best, then limestone, and then maybe followed by quartz. That may be a reverse on, again, chemical compatibility with your components. Try various binder sources. Look at different modifiers. Look at different... I mentioned about the the uh, the bio oils. I mentioned about the aramid fiber. Look at these different products. Let's talk now uh, for the remainder of the time about mixed modification, and then we're going to open it up to some questions. Uh, this is a, a project that I just got through showing uh, earlier in the slide where where I went in and I moved into the box. These are the actual values where I took the sixty four twenty two. And I, and, I, and I used a single dose aramid fiber into it. Then I went back and even used a double dose into it. And by doing that, um, I'm moving this product even further up on the CT chart. I did that in a, in a 7022 and I added even a double dose and I go even higher on a CT chart. Now you may ask, why does my 7022 begin to drop down? Well, unfortunately, the CT index is not perfect. Matter of fact, the CT test may be telling us at that mid-level temperature, again, not a lot of pavements crack at around 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 25 C or close to it. Um, but that's the temperature we're testing at. At that temperature, a 7022 is a little bit stiffer than a 6422. A 7622 is a little stiffer than that. And so you can see those numbers begin to go and, and it may show a little more cracking on the CT index. In reality, because of the polymer in it, it may actually perform a little better. So just realize there's some adjustment that has to be done on that. 
In this picture, you actually, the top picture, you see the aramid fiber in a loose form as it begins to, to, to expand. Um, and in this picture here, uh, you see it um, um, uh, in the mixture. I get a lot of questions. How do you measure dispersion? And can it be done today a lot better than what it used to? The tools are in place, the automatic dosing machines, the dispersion, uh, everything that I have dealt with, I'm very confident with the product and it's much more advanced than what it ever was uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, this was a popular product. Even the, the polyester fibers was a popular product in the 90s, but couldn't be done well because of lack of dispersion. And what I'm working with today in the, in the companies I get to see, uh, that's not an issue. But again, one way to, in, to, to, to fix your CT index if you can't just increase asphalt content or having other issues. Another way um, is, is a bio oil product. I'm gonna, I know my picture is small, but I'll bring it up into the picture. And you see that I have a, and the oil here, it's the same picture as what you're looking at there on the screen to the left. This product, um, and again, it's one of the brands that's out there. There's several different brands and I've worked with several of those different companies. I really, really like the renewable oil technology, whether soybean based or corn oil, uh, corn based. We typically see soybean based in this area. Uh, up in the Iowa area, you see more of the corn based uh, just because of the location. These products are really, really good. They, they didn't really even come onto the scene until after about 2015 or when I began picking up on them. And these products are, are particularly interesting because they seem to be as good as an aromatic oil, which is was one of the refiners real tricks that they would use to soften binders. Um, and, it, and it blends well and it adds the resins back in. Um, it works really, really well at beginning to soften an asphalt binder. What's pretty unique about the bio oils and the aramid fiber, I can add these at the hot mix plant. Matter of fact, Virginia did several high wrap projects uh, under VTRC and I know um, VAA was out on these projects where they looked at the high wrap uh, projects. I think they were using up to 40% wrap and some maybe even more. And where, the, where these uh, type of oils were being, being uh, review, looked at and even uh, softer binders in general. So it is very possible. In this case, we, we look at just what I do to, to soften the binder. I can go from a 60 CT up to 120. Uh, again, how much did I put in there? Uh, maybe 3% by weight of the virgin binder to get it to go to there. And um, that may be equivalent, for instance, of lowering a 22 down to a 28 grade. Now, the other thing that I did is I also looked at, at, at aging. If I put additional six hours of aging and of course, and I still see a very similar increase here. What the reason I did this is that while I saw a 35% decrease in my overall values, I saw the same change here from control to the, to the, to the aged bio oil on this one. It was a tough track binder. And the reason that's important is if I were to have put the additional aging and this, and this one would have dropped equal, that would have told me that during the aging process, all my bio oil basically went away and that would not be good. In this case, it's acting, it's acting uh, as an asphalt binder. <clears throat> Remember that I mentioned earlier about binder sources. This is that slide. Now, ignore the, the 0.38 um, uh, D Central Kentucky uh, lingo. That's a, that's a 3 8 inch mix or a 9.5 millimeter mix uh, but it is using a central Kentucky limestone. A lot going on here that I want to bring up. This is using two different binder sources. That's all that we changed here. No fiber, no bio oils, just two different 6422s. In this case, I want to focus on just the middle. And I used one binder and I get a 123. I use the other one and I get a 25. Now I did some other things here to also help you to understand the temperature of your machines and how that works. But I want you just to pay attention if, if depending on where you're at um, in Kentucky, they're using a CT that's closer to hundred, one would be passing, one's failing. Uh, again, depending on where you're at, uh, this can cause you to be a passing or failing result just from the binder. But the other factor that plays into that is the hauling and the transportation and availability of that asphalt binder. Now I want to look to the left and look to the right. And the reason I show these is I used a 20 C test temperature and I used a 30 C test temperature. Now, why do I do that? Well, I end up testing products for the Northern area of the U S I end up testing at 30 C that I may uh, look at, look at values. That's 
that's coming from uh, the, the, the Southwest. And really the goal with this test is, is to have, uh, it would be nice if we all had a value of 70 or all had a value of a hundred or whatever it may be. And we only changed our test temperature. So that's stuff that I'm trying to understand, but how that relates to you is this. Notice that the blue bar, regardless of the test temperature, is always above the red bar. So very consistently, uh, that one binder, no matter what temperature I tested it at, would outperform the other one. The other thing to note on this one is that calibrate, calibrate, calibrate your, your water on your bath or your air, ever how you're testing your samples, and notice that a five degree change can make a huge difference on your ideal CT results. Another one that I wanna to mention to sort of put a combo together is I ended up on a project where I got asked by the city of Louisville and the city of Lexington. Now, while the two cities don't get along uh, when it comes to the, um, the Wildcats and the, and, the, and the Louisville Cardinals, one thing that they can't agree on is they wanted to look at using uh, more rap, especially the city of Lexington, it, and understand uh, as the challenge has been is how do we make a more sustainable option? But can we do it? Can we do it without losing the durability that we have today? Now, there's other slides I could have brought up to go into a lot of details on this, but um, and and we actually looked at Hamburg values and we and rutting and we looked at. Um, ideal CT on this to make sure that the city of Louisville and Lexington ended up with a balanced mixed design approach that they did not give up uh, the, the, um, uh, the performance. Very similar to what VTRC and VAA and the, and the state was doing on the high wrap projects that they put down as with a BMD approach. In this case, uh, this stands for, um, um, uh, this is a, a plant mix lab compacted sample. So when you see the PMLC, plant mix lab compacted. And, and when I grab this sample, um, this is 36% high wrap is what this one was. What I did was the blue one represents the high wrap mix. The red one represents um, a 20% wrap with, with just the aramid fiber. And this one, the... the, the um, the green is just the wrap, okay? So this is just the wrap only. Um, and uh, I think I'm missing something there, 20% wrap. I, I know I'm missing a, a label that's off of that one. So anyway, uh, the point on this one is this, this product here, and this is a brand name, so sorry about that. Uh, what the blue bar is representing is a combination of the aramid fiber and the bio oil. So now we're softening the binder and we're using the polymer in the aramid to reinforce it, uh, to be able to do a one-two punch, to be able to use high wrap and, and be able to outperform a 20% with aramid fiber. Well, why is that important? The city of Louisville well, I was already using aramid fiber with 20% wrap. Now they could use higher wrap with this combination of materials and even achieve better performance. Again, uh, as you do that, you got to have contractors that have that's the commitment to the um, to the, uh, the the proper stockpiling of the wrap, the care of the piles, the drainage of the piles, uh, the moisture, um, double screening decks, the plant that can handle it, on and on and on. But if contractors, um, if you the contractor that's out there are willing to do this, this is very achievable. The next graph over, uh, next set of bars is with four hours of aging. And then the next one was with eight hours of aging. And that was important to understand on aging gradient. Um, if Johnny Habush is on and watches this, I know Johnny, you will love the aging gradient that you get to see uh, on that because it's important to understand the long-term impacts. With that, I do want to tell you sort of a good news story. Uh, the city of Lexington watched the, the one roadway, which was the, um, the street uh, called Mercer Street uh, here in, in, um, here in uh, Lexington. And, and that road is a, is a heavy vehicle roadway that uh, it's a transport roadway that goes from the Amazon, FedEx, UPS, Georgia Pacific facilities right to the airport. So it's a heavy loaded two lane roadway. They want, the city of Lexington said, let's go and put down a high wrap version. And they even use 45% wrap. They, we had to do the same thing. We had to measure to make sure 
that we understood where we were on the on the everyday product that went down. And then we looked at the combination with the high wrap going up to 45%. Also with the bio oil and the aramid fiber to say, can we do this? After three winters, the high wrap project is outperforming the, the control, which had just a regular 7622 product with 20% wrap in it. Matter of fact, on a PCI rating, those that, that use payment condition indexes, it's it's uh, outranking, outperforming uh, it by about a factor of, or by a, a, a number of five to six points, uh, which is significant on a three, going on four-year-old project. That led to where the city went to this past year, and they have converted 20% of their annual volume to high wrap mixes. And that's working with a contractor who knows how to really do this well, uh, with a good public-private relationship. And the city's quite excited. Um, uh, they're, they're, they're keeping an eye on it, naturally. But at the same time, they're very excited to make this step forward. The contractor's excited. He's beginning to use a mountain of wrap. His other alternate was to haul it off. And now he's using 45% wrap with a combination of the bio oil and aramid fiber. And that's going down on um, a large uh, portion of the work in the city of Lexington. So hats off to, to, to agencies like that who are willing to implement technology versus leaving it on a, on, on a bookshelf. With that, I wanna spend the rest of the time on this and uh, a few slides and we'll close it out for the day. This one's one you can uh, pull your camera out, grab a screenshot, uh, but I want to go over and and if if I'm a contractor, if I'm a designer, I want to understand some of these critical points. This is Phil Blankenship's opinion on how these items work. If I increase my AC, I'm going to get a good bump on ideal CT. And, and why I have Hamburg here, just pretend this is APA, please. And then uh, I'm not, on this one, uh, I'm going to have a negative result on my rutting, usually but my density is gonna be easier to compact in the field. The reason I put density in here is we can make it crack free or rut free all day long, but we better be able to build these pavements and understand how they compact in the field. If I lower my PG, it'll help me on ideal CT. Uh, it'll have a negative effect on Hamburg as the inverse is, if I have a higher PG, <clears throat> it, will, it will hurt me on ideal CT, but help me on Hamburg. Typically, um, the, the softer PG is a little easier to compact than the harder PG in the field. I want you to look at, as we go down the list, at what each of these do, and I won't read them all, but I'll just I'll go down through here and hit on a few. The time under the heat or in the oven or in a silo is very, very, very important to understand what that does on my CT in Hamburg. <clears throat> this one becomes critical for the designer because if I leave my mixture, by the way, I've left it in the oven 15 minutes too long. Realize it's going to lower your ideal CT. Or if I pull it out too early, it'll do just the opposite. Look at what increase in wrap does. Look at what increase in dust proportion or, or my dust would do. High absorption aggregate. Recycling agents, the bio oil type. Again, it's gonna help me here. Um, sort of a negative value on the Hamburg, not bad, but it's, it will, it will lower your values or on the APA, but it can actually make it a little easier to compact in the field. Very similar to warm mix, um, warm mix additives that can help you on CT may hurt you may not even change Hamburg, but definitely makes it easier to compact in the field. Maybe even three stars or three, three pluses should go there. Aramid fiber is a pretty unique product that helps ideal CT helps Hamburg. They claim it can help a little bit in getting density. I wish I had proof to tell you that it did. I think it does where it holds the mat together, uh, but, but I just don't have that data to share with you. Um, and then I always like to put at the very bottom, um, the questions come out, uh, what about a thicker paving mat? Well, it doesn't help me on CT or Hamburg, but it definitely makes the density easier to achieve. Again, the whole game here is I encourage contractors develop a plot like this to know where you're at so you can get into this box. <clears throat> With that, uh, Trent and Mike, the folks there at Virginia um, Asphalt Association, my good friends in Virginia and everyone listening today, thank you very much for allowing me to be able to present. And with that, uh, we'd like to open it to questions. Man, great information, Phil. A lot to... Uh to take in a lot of, you know, that very last 
Phil's opinion on what impacts ideal CT, your rutting, uh, density, you know, all those go together to make a mix that will not only perform in the lab, but more importantly, perform in the field. Thank you. So a lot of great information, a lot of things that give the designer since, you know, we're having this webinar and this webcast here as we're winding down our paving season and we're starting to roll into our next season where we're seeing more and more balanced mixed design on our projects. I think I heard the number today about 1.3 million tons will be designed by BMD uh, across the state. Actually, I think the number is even higher than that. Uh, we're going to do a lot of testing during the season, collecting a lot more information, a lot more data. But the strive is, and I think you opened up with it, is, you know, volumetrics got us to this point. But as we move in to true performance, it is how do we look at all the tools that are available to the designer? Because uh, even if you can design it, if your plant can't produce it, it doesn't really matter. So it's a balancing act on what you have, what your plant's able to do, and then start saying, what do we need to do to maximize performance in terms of minimize cracking, minimize rutting, long-term du durability, and just the graphs from the research and the work that you've done there at BAT will help those that are watching today and will watch the recording later really understand how it ties together. So what we'd really like to believe. do... Uh, I really believe, uh, Trenton, that, you know, I, I say today is the day of the contractor. The knowledge uh, used to lie in, in, in so many other places, but the, the contractor now has so many, um, uh, uh, so much availability to get training and they have the tools and there's no better place uh, for the innovation to happen. So the day of the contractors here and the, uh, the tools are in their hands and I'm excited to see what comes next. All right. Well, with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and just start looking through the questions. Again, if you have any questions, just type them in and we'll read through them. And when the time expires, the time expires. So definitely thank you, Phil. And let's get into the questions. Thank you. All right, we're done. Let me okay. stop sharing and let me go to.